talk about how to start composing your scene. Jumping into an environment scene like this can be quite daunting. It's very difficult to know where to start. And so I like to start by trying to get the proper angle. So imagine if I hadn't made these yet. The first thing I did was I ended up creating a different camera, which is here, camera one. And all you do is go create cameras, camera. And you can change which camera you're looking at through with the perspective panel. And so here it's set to camera one. Uh, I'm also using a multi-grid setup, and then I used the little arrows down here. You can't see it because of my screen resolution. But I used it to change what windows are where. So this is actually the quote-unquote top view, and then uh, I changed the uh, top view camera to a different camera. Meanwhile, over here is the actual perspective camera, and it lets us just zoom around and see where our scene is. I then went, while that camera was selected, so there was my camera, View, import image, image plane, or rather, view image plane, import image. And when you do that, you are brought to this panel, which lets you select an image to uh, use as your image plane. One thing to keep in mind is occasionally it's useful to go back here and just reduce the alpha or increase it to compare and contrast with your scene. Uh, I actually then set up my render settings so that I can move around and try and get an understanding of what I'm looking at. So in my render settings, I just set this to mental ray. The quality is the uh, is uh, set to production, and then I immediately changed it to JPEG camera one as my renderable cameras. So I'll be using the camera that I want for my view, and just a low res uh, resolution at 320 by 240. I don't really care about uh, all the little details right now, I'm just caring about how my scene is composed, which I can see in the 3D view, and how the lighting is working, which if you render at a high res is going to be very frustrating. So you want to render at a very small uh, frame size to begin with. <coughs> and I haven't changed any other settings yet. Because we're still composing this in pre-visualization, you want to start out by just having really basic lights. So all I did was add a directional light, and it's set to, I don't know, I think it's just the default. So that's going to be something we can use to get this. Now, one thing to note is that the way I found out what it look in this, excuse me, is, I'll turn my alpha off for now. My grid go. Now I started off by having this image plane here, or rather the ground plane and when I imported my image plane I had to figure out where this was and that could be a little bit tricky I'm just going to switch to using this one right now so you can see sort of a straight or a parallel or a perspective line right here uh, which I could use to match up with the grid and it's important to note that although this landscape is very hilly water is going to sink to a certain level so we can use that as a flat idea of where we're starting at and we can try to get some matching perspective another perspective clue is in theory this house although it might have varying supports the roof is going to eventually be pointing uh, horizontal our perspective is going to mimic that now if I turn off the grid here you can see from our image that we're looking at something where we're standing on the ground. Uh, this was probably painted by somebody who, if the water level is our zero, is probably a meter or two off the ground by coming up this hill, maybe a little less. So next up, we have to get a sense of scale. And that's why I created a human. So if we look at one of these, uh, these are 
uh, just a default cube. Create polygon primitives cube, and that cube comes in at about one meter, uh, one meter tall. So again, this is set in centimeters, so the cube being one grid size tall means it's one meter. So I just first off set it to. I went into edit mode. Selected all these faces, and then using discrete scale or discrete move on relative transform, I moved all those faces up on the y axis, which I'm using for this scene, uh, one amount. So now, oh wait, never mind. Since it's one unit, it's going to be 0.5, so negative 0.5 to get back. So now that bottom face is on the bottom plane, and that represents this quote unquote person's feet. I could then select this face and move it up 0.8 and that now represents a 1.8 meter tall person. You can then make this a little more person like say making him broader than he is wide or broader than he is thick and then perhaps shrinking him down to have a head so we can tell that it's a person. This is just generally my preferred way to have a sense of scale because I think figures kind of are oftentimes the way that a piece is sold. And you can see that those little figures back in there, uh, they were probably included in this painting specifically because uh, they gave a sense of scale. So now I have this problem of I accidentally lost my perspective and that's where I end up using the timeline a lot. So if I have one of these guys, I can move him and I have this perspective grid where I think it's on the ground. I can now move this guy further back, further back, and that way make sure I'm not going up and down into space, which would be bad because we'd lose our sense of perspective. But I can move him back and we can start to measure him against these two people in the background. We can also measure him against this house, which is why I have this floating person up here. This was moved about as not quite as far back as these guys, but then list, lifted up so that I could imagine him going through a doorway right over here for this cabin. But now I want to keep this perspective forever. Now if I have my camera selected and I'm in that perspective, I can just hit S and it'll set a keyframe for all of these. So by hitting S, set a keyframe. Now when I'm rotating around here, Messing with my scene, oh no, I lost my perspective. I can just move the timeline a little bit, and I'm back to my render. Let's see, let's try rendering this. Again, it just has a basic light, and right now, with no objects in the scene, I do get that background image, and just because it's going to be something that I can pair and contrast to, I'm going to go File, Keep Image in Render View. That way, for future renders, I can uh, use that as a guideline when comparing geometry to this image and trying to match the camera. <clears throat> but you can see uh, some of these guys are generally in perspective. And that was step two. So let's turn on this terrain layer. But you can see two planes. One is uh, a landscape and one represents the water. The water again stays very, very flat. It represents our zero horizon essentially and so we keep that flat and this one we sculpt around it the first thing I was trying to do is figure out where this crazy river is going to be which could be very very daunting and that's where that scale comes into play uh, as a useful feature I could use this little man who uh, if we go to wireframe, we can see is uh, against those other people as to scale. Or this guy, I believe, is on the opposite water side. So this bay, this embankment might come a little closer. Indeed, this bank has to come a little wider. I'll get to sculpting that in a moment. But by finding out using this camera view where this guy was located in perspective. I was then able to 
so here he is against the playing with these other humans. I'll turn the grid off. Now I could end up trying to move duplicates of him forward. This was actually the first one I made. And I can duplicate them and move them around until they line up with essentially a guide for where this river is going to be. So if I duplicated him, I could say where this bush hits the water by going forward and forward. And just about there is where he would hit the water, or where this bush hits the water. And if we turn on the terrain, that looks about right. Next up, we're trying to sculpt this landscape so that it fits. And this was just started off as a gigantic default plane. I just went create polygon primitives plane. I scaled it up. I moved it about there. Turn this terrain off. And then to get the geometry I needed for that kind of detail. I went mesh, smooth, click the options box, I set the divisions to two, and then I set the UV boundary to no interpolation rather than smooth. And that meant that when I uh, smooth it, it creates squares instead of uh, a smooth version of it. So it stays rigid. Next up came the task of sculpting it. And here is where those people come in handy. So we can see, based off of where these people come, that there's going to be a river that kind of comes, let's use our grease pencil. Grease pencil is just a way you can draw on the screen. We can see now that our river is going to go something like that, right? Okay, my keyframe's still there. So that's essentially where this river is going to go. Now, how do I sculpt that onto this? You can use the sculpt geometry tool. That's step one. When you do this, you can double click on the icon over here in the tools panel to get better options. You get a couple things you can change around. One is the radius and the secondary radius essentially says how hard or soft it is. You can generally leave it at zero. But here you can see the size of the brush increase. <coughs> Additionally, you can change the height that it's going to sculpt. So in my initial sculpting that might seem a little too strong or too weak. So I can change the max displacement. So I'm going to change this to around there. And then you have your different brushes. Push and pull do exactly what you think. One. Uh, one of them goes up and one goes down. But you can actually hold control to get the opposite effect of the brush you're using. So I can use control. And we can start bringing the river in where we saw that the bank was too close. There's also a smooth brush, but you don't actually have to click on it. At any time, you can hold shift and then you can brush away your recently brushed detail. A lot of times this is a little difficult especially when you have multiple objects. Uh, it can make drawing very difficult. So a lot of times I go to show and turn off selection highlighting. That way, whatever I'm drawing on is not going to end up affecting the view as much. Let's check that view now. That looks pretty good. <coughs> 
I just put some default Lamberts on here to give us an idea of grass versus uh, water. And now we can test it by rendering. Again, I set my render to mental ray and camera one as my render. <coughs> and if we render it, we can start to compare how we've laid out this river compared to our previous one. Right there. So it looks pretty good to me. I think this is water, so we might want to make that. Uh, it looks like this little embankment has to come down a little bit, and this little shoreline has to come forward around to about the midline of our composition. So that's a, a good way to start on your scene. Uh, you don't have to have all of this, but it's a good place to begin because now we don't have to worry so much about where all these objects go. And we can start looking at different files where we just create the trees and we just create uh, the grass and then come back and apply it later. <coughs>